Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's seminar. My name is Patrick Tapia. I'm the Vice President of Counseling for HS2 Academy. Uh, so tonight's seminar, uh, I wanted to go through some of the myths that people have about college admissions. Uh, so it'll be a wide ranging uh, list of myths, uh, ranging from things like the actual application process to things like standardized testing, to even things like applying for financial aid. I just want to be able to kind of go through some of the things that I've been hearing a lot from both students and parents and trying to really, um, I guess, tell you a little bit more about the process so that um, a lot of people aren't perpetuating these myths, right? Uh, so um, before we get to it, I just want to ask that you please kindly refrain from recording any of the information here. Uh, we normally do have a YouTube uh, version of this as well. Uh, so if you missed any information, we would probably make it available in the, um, the HS2 uh, blog. Okay, so without further ado, let's jump right into it. So the first myth that we're going to discuss here is that college admissions prefer well-rounded students. I'm pretty sure some of you have already heard these, uh, especially in connection with things like the Ivy League schools, right? So there's this idea that you have to be like perfectly well-rounded. You need a sport, you need leadership, you need volunteering, you need all these different things. Um, so I, I'm here to tell you that that's not exactly 100% um, accurate. Um, here's why. Um, if you are completely well-rounded and you don't really excel at anything, that's actually something that works to your disadvantage when it comes to college admissions. Simply put, like a top college like a Harvard or Princeton or Yale doesn't really want 2,000 equally well-rounded but somewhat mediocre individuals, right? So what they really want is a well-rounded freshman class. And you can't really have a well-rounded freshman class unless you have people who are really good at certain things. So what these top colleges really want here are people who are gonna be like good scientists, good musicians, people who really excel at various other activities like speech and debate, for instance. So um, these are all things that they want, right? So they want people who are really good at it so that they can help give the, rep uh, like the university a better reputation. So ultimately, what you really want here is not necessarily that you have to have a little bit of everything and to the point where you sacrifice uh, certain things that you're good at, right? So I've never heard any colleges in the admissions process say things like, oh, all our applicants or all, all our accepted students need to have had a sport or need to have had like a leadership position, right? So that's simply not the way admissions works. Uh, so if anything, they're looking for people who can be truly excellent at certain things, right? So our recommendation typically is to look for activities that you're truly passionate about and try to be really excellent in because that's the best way to impress admissions school. Uh, so I served as a Harvard admissions interviewer for several years. And when we used to do interviews, this was kind of like similar to what we would rate people in. So we would have a scale, in this case, one to six, although five and six are more for like special circumstances. So it's really just a scale of one to four. As you can see on the scale, um, the ones that are rated one aren't necessarily people who check the box of every type of activity. It, there's not even a qualifier here in terms of how many activities you're involved in, right? So they simply want to know, does a student have national or international recognition or you know, possibly even professional potential in that particular activity or activities, right? Um, the number two would be substantial school-wide, regional, or state recognition, or major contribution or leadership. So to some degree, I suppose some quantity would be necessary here. You can't just have one thing and have that count as major contribution. But it's not necessarily something that prioritizes how many you have, but rather the highest level you can achieve. So colleges are much more concerned about like your top shelf potential in certain activities. And so ultimately, that's what we normally recommend that you strive for. Right. So in, you know, in the debate about pointy versus rounded, a lot of top colleges do tend to prefer the pointy students. Uh, but, you know, obviously the best case scenario is a student that's a little bit more balanced as well in the sense that you do have ideally maybe one or two activities or possibly even three activities that you're exceptionally good at. So you're pointy in those things, but you also still have complementary activities. So you're not necessarily the Jack or Jill of all trades where you have like eight to 10 activities and you do them all kind of, you know, like you're very good, you're mediocre at a lot of things, but you don't really truly excel, right? But 
you know, I, I guess it's not necessarily as ideal either to have someone who is a pure specialist who only does that one thing and does has no other interests because then, yeah, it doesn't look like you're willing to try new things, right? But ideally, um, what we've seen, you know, yield the best results are students who can focus and excel on a couple of key activities, and then also complement that by showing they have interest in other things as well, okay? So it's important though, not to sacrifice any sort of like activities that you do really well, just to artificially make yourself more well-rounded. I've had conversations with some students before where like, you know, they made decisions like, oh, you know what? I had to not necessarily go for this sport at this higher level because I heard I needed this activity or that activity. Or people who say, for example, felt the need that they must have something like a sport. And so therefore they don't have enough practice or, or enough time to practice on like, let's say music or speech and debate, if those activities are the ones that they're actually much better in, okay? So it's all a balancing act. So I think uh, the most important thing is even earlier on, like even in middle school or maybe early in high school, try to figure out which of your activities or your passions you truly are the best in, right? Try to gauge what your highest level of potential is. And that's where you probably want to direct most of your energies in high school to get truly good at those one or two activities. I think that's really the best way to get the, you know, ideally the best results for college admissions. Okay. And as you saw from the chart, ideally you really should strive to be rated uh, so that you could potentially be even like statewide or nationally recognized for a certain activity. That would be the best case if your aspiration is to get to a top university like an Ivy League school or like, like a Stanford or MIT. Okay. All right. So hopefully that gives you a sense in terms of, you know, how colleges evaluate your activities and maybe how to prioritize your time. Okay, so the next myth I want to talk about here, uh, and it's especially relevant now because a lot of colleges due to the pandemic have gone test optional. So are the SAT or ACT even needed anymore? Uh, I'm sure many of you have heard that the UCs and now the Cal States are, you know, what they call test blind, they don't even evaluate your SAT or ACT scores as part of the admissions process anymore. So is there still a place for SAT or ACT? Well, our simple answer is still yes, okay? A good SAT or ACT score can still make you stand out uh, for the, in any private schools that you're applying to uh, relative to your competition. So even though it's true that a lot of schools are now test optional, um, in general, I think test optional works best if you are a straight A student already, because then if you don't submit a test score, the, uh, the I guess you could say that the emphasis is shifted a little bit more on all those other factors, which means absent an SAT or ACT, they're gonna scrutinize your grades more, they're gonna scrutinize your activities more uh, relative to some other students who are applying also test optional, okay? So if you do plan to go test optional, like I said, you know, definitely evaluate your profile if you project as a strong candidate without your test scores, then that might be okay, right? But in general, um, based on what we've seen over the last couple of admission cycles, more students who are getting accepted to top schools will still submit an SAT or ACT, okay? So at UPenn, for instance, the last couple of years, about 70 or 75% of admitted students still submitted an SAT or ACT, okay? Now, also, uh, you might have heard that in 20. Uh, 24, there's also going to be a new version of the SAT. It's going to be a computer adaptive version of the SAT, right? And so College Board would not have, you know, gone to that great length to go ahead and create a new test if they didn't have confidence that colleges would be on board in terms of recognizing this test, which also lends credence to the fact that they're, you know, colleges may be more and more inclined to go ahead and require the SAT again in the future once sort of the pandemic dies down and they feel like they can actually benefit from the data um, coming from having an SAT or ACT, okay? All right, so ultimately um, the results still bear that like it generally helps your chances of admissions if you have a good SAT or ACT score. So this is a small sampling. Not all schools actually reveal the breakdown of their acceptance rates with or with without SATs, but even within this group of schools, you can see that in some schools, it makes a huge difference, right? So, so in some of these schools, it's practically almost double or even more than double the acceptance rate if you do submit an SAT or ACT versus if you went test optional, okay? So schools like Emory, for example, that's more than double, right? Uh, Georgetown, uh, almost double, right? So for a lot of these schools, it makes a lot of sense if you have good test scores for you to go ahead and still submit your test scores, okay? But, you know, of course, 
you know, these days, if testing is really not your strength, you've at least given it a fair shot and you're still not able to get the scores you're looking for, there are options now, right? Because you can simply go test optional or you can apply to schools that are test blind, even like the UC system so that you can really just play to your strengths. Okay, so ultimately what does HS2 recommend? So if you're currently a younger student, if you're still in ninth grade or even in middle school right now, it's best for you to kind of like investigate um, whether or not you can do pretty well on SAT or ACT before the change of formats, right? Uh, so if testing really isn't your strength, you can always go test optional, but this should not be your first priority, right? So you should first try to see if you can get a really competitive score because it'll just give you more options. It'll open things up for you if you do have a competitive SAT or ACT score, okay? Uh, for younger students, you can also try to see if the new version of the SAT coming out in 2024 might be a better uh, option for you, um, but we have to at least wait until this fall, possibly the spring, for College Board to release some practice tests. So you may want to wait a little bit. A safer option right now would probably be to go with the ACT because there are no major changes planned over the next few years. So if you committed to taking the ACT and you're doing pretty well, uh, that's probably a more predictable route because you know that the format's not going to change and there's a lot more practice material to work with uh, rather than like banking on changes to the SAT because even if College Board releases some practice tests, uh, let's say this fall or the spring, they're not going to be you know, previously released tests in their entirety, they're usually going to be maybe just cut and paste jobs of old tests or repurposed questions to make it look like the type that they're going to have on the test. So oftentimes this was the same problem when they changed the SAT, you know, uh, several years back, that was kind of the format change is when we got the new version of the SAT, the, the practice tests were easier, right? Um, just because they weren't actual release tests. So in this case, um, if you are looking for testing right now, I would generally steer students towards the ACT first because at least we know what is, you know, what, what to expect. There's a ton more practice tests to work with. Okay, now if you're also trying to project what kind of scores you would need to be competitive, you can oftentimes look at the 75th percentile scores for both the SAT and the ACT. That's oftentimes a pretty good indication of what kind of score you would need to be competitive for these schools. Now, more and more, as colleges stay test optional for longer, that's just gradually going to inflate the average test scores in these schools, because then if you remove all the lower scoring ones in the past, then, you know, the people who are submitting test scores, they're going to be, they're going to err on the higher side, right? So these are even going to scoot up even higher. So instead of the 75th percentile, this will probably shift closer to like the 50th percentile scores eventually, right? So these, you know, you can do some research online, you could take a look at what these current 75th percentile scores and that would actually be a pretty good indication of the scores you would need to be competitive for those schools. Okay. Now, if you don't have anywhere near that, then yeah, you could probably consider going test optional if the rest of your profile, if your academics look pretty strong. Okay. Next myth, college acceptance rates depend on your major, right? So there's a lot of sort of like misunderstanding about this. Um, well, well, there's back and forth, right? So uh, first of all, does it? Well, it's a tricky one because, you know, this is not entirely an untrue kind of like myth, right? So it depends. It depends on some schools. Some schools do in fact base your acceptance rate based on which major you select or which school or college within the overall university you apply to. But for a lot of other schools, for like a lot of top private schools, they don't actually, right? So they don't really make decisions based on their, their, your major. They're largely looking for very smart students who you know, can overall add to the freshman class, right? So um, Basically, if you, if you want to take a look at kind of the snapshot of what other schools have said about this, let's take a look at Stanford, right? So for Stanford, for instance, um, on their website, they say that when you apply to Stanford, you're applying to the university as a whole, not to a particular major department or school. Uh, so they say, we encourage you to indicate prospective majors and career interests in the application, but please know that you're not bound by these selections in any way, right? And true enough, like Stanford doesn't have any sort of set quotas in terms of how many people they accept for certain majors. Now, of course, because Stanford is in the Bay Area, it does attract a lot of students who are going to be good for either business or, you know, things like engineering or computer science. But it's not like other schools where there's the decidedly lower acceptance rate if you're going in for those majors, right? So at the end of the day, 
um, you don't necessarily want to be too focused on strategy where you're second guessing yourself. Um, for a lot of top schools, it's just best to embrace what you're best at intellectually, right? Rather than trying to game the system by picking a, an, an obscure major in the application, okay? Now, Harvard basically says much the same, right? So on their website, it says, Harvard does not require that its incoming first year students declare a major. In fact, students don't officially declare their concentrations until the fall of their sophomore year. So yeah, so if you're applying for Harvard College, for instance, they just generally give you a list of broader areas, like are you interested in social science or engineering or humanities, right? They don't ask you to list a specific major like some other colleges do in the Harvard application, right? So in this case, they know that if you're a smart student that you might explore some other fields, they probably have a long history of seeing students maybe change majors as they explore. Um, and they're savvy enough not to be gamed by certain students who are picking just a, a, you know, a strategy major that you know, they're not gonna stick with, right? So it's best to actually for these top, top schools like Harvard or Stanford or Princeton, show a consistent narrative in terms of what you're passionate about rather than having all your stuff be CS related and all of a sudden, you know, like head scratchingly put like history on your college application, thinking that, oh, they're not going to be as many history majors, right? But if there's nothing in your profile to suggest that you're into history at all, that's just going to work against you, right? So it's actually better for you to go ahead and just lean into your strengths for these top schools. And this is oftentimes where we have the best success for students who have a very clear cut narrative in terms of what they're passionate about, what they want to study, because they're going to see this elsewhere. They're going to see this in the interview. They're going to see this in your recommendation letters. So you want to come across with the consistent sort of theme or narrative about like what it is that you want to study, you know, what it is that you're intellectually very passionate about. I think that's the much more successful overall strategy for applying to those top schools. Now, there are going to be some schools, though, where you, if you do some research, there are some schools where the acceptance rate is tied to a certain school or college. One example of this is Carnegie Mellon. So if you actually looked at their website, they, they break down for you the acceptance rates based on if you're applying for their School of Engineering, their School of Computer Science, you know, their Tepper School of Business, for instance. So as you can see, Carnegie Mellon, because it is oftentimes widely ranked or, or commonly ranked as the number one computer science school, as you can probably see, if you're applying for computer science, it's 7%. Whereas if you went for engineering, the overall acceptance rate for the School of Engineering is like 20%, right? So for certain schools, you can do a little bit more of like strategic decision making. Now, keep in mind, though, that yes, you can pick a less competitive major, but it may or may not give you access later on. Like School of Computer Science for Carnegie Mellon, it's very restrictive, almost to the point where it's almost impossible to change majors to the School of Computer Science later on. So if you do pick another school, like if you go for you know, engineering, for example, you should be prepared to take you know, most, if not all, of your coursework in that school. Okay. Now, fortunately, like for Carnegie Mellon, something like computer engineering is technically housed in their school of computer uh, school of engineering so you could still get a lot of cs coding courses even if you're not necessarily graduating from their school of computer science okay so these are all things that you can strategize before you know making a decision in terms of which college majors you want to put down uh, still others are even much more rigid in terms of the acceptance rates being tied to certain majors. Uh, you could see this with many of the UCs, right? So for UC San Diego, for example, if you were to look at their website, they list what are called capped majors. In some other UCs, these are called impacted majors, which are generally more competitive or more restrictive majors where there's fewer spots available so that the acceptance rate to these things are actually going to be much lower than if you apply to majors that are uncapped. So as you can see, UC San Diego is very known for its engineering program, but it's also very strong for bio, right? There's a lot of good solid pre-med students, you know, wanting to get into UC San Diego. So as you can well imagine, those are all part of the list of the impacted majors for San Diego. So if you were to go for a different other major, like if you were to go for, oddly enough, chemistry, you know, you could probably go there and not have that be impacted because it doesn't fall under the school biological sciences, neither does it fall in the physics department. So strategically, if you knew what you were doing, you could decide to put yourself as a chemistry major and go pre-med to UC San Diego and benefit from slightly better acceptance rates than if you were to go for bio or physics or public health.
okay, or biomedical engineering, right? So it's just about knowing the schools, knowing which majors are more difficult, and then trying to find those like sweet spots, right? But there's not a one size fits all strategy, right? So just because you have one strategy major for a certain college doesn't mean that that's necessarily going to be the same one you're going to use for all the schools, okay? Or whether or not you even want to take advantage of or use a strategy major, okay? So our recommendation do your research when you're putting together your college list, right? Try to figure out what their system is, whether or not they, they pick people overall or whether or not they select students by major, for instance, right? Um, because that can drastically affect your strategy, okay? So oftentimes, like one of the things that HS2 counselors do really well is have these conversations with our students when, when they're, before they apply and come up with a master strategy for all your schools, right? Uh, for these colleges, we, we can go for this major. For these other colleges, we can go for this major to really try to optimize your chances of getting into the schools that you want to get into, okay? So if the schools you're interested in have separate admissions process uh, processes for like a certain major, for instance, you also want to work to have strong evidence for your major, right? So let's say, for example, if it's harder to get into Berkeley for engineering, right, which it is, right, um, you're going to want strong evidence that you're actually a very potentially, you know, good student for engineering, right? So, you know, if you have like, you know, competitions, you have awards, you have like, you know, your own independent research, you've done internships with college professors, those can all be ways to show that you have more advanced skills than the average applicant, right? So that's going to be really good. Okay. Now, even those colleges like Ivy's, for instance, that don't necessarily select people by major, it still helps to have very strong evidence for your major to show academic passion for your field, right? So they can see that you have a genuine love of learning, that you have like intellectual excitement and creativity. Those are all things that these top schools tend to look for. And so if even if you're not necessarily going with the strategy major per se, you know, leaning into your strengths and showing that you're actually a very interested in a certain field can definitely help you, okay? So the next myth, 